Hey, again, I am so glad to be here. I don't know if I tell you enough, but I love you. I love our church family. I love what you're doing in our community. And uh, today we're going to start a series that's kind of reminiscent of one we did several years ago. It's not going to be some of the, it's going to be some of the same, but there's going to be a lot of new things. I've already got two messages on the front end that are different than what we did before, but I think they're going to come together. And I'm calling this series, Aha. Have you ever had just like an aha moment in your life where something you, you didn't know and All of a sudden you did know or you saw a truth, something happened, you think, aha, that's true. Aha, that's a part of something and I didn't know it before. Maybe it was a truth that you didn't know that you had never heard. Perhaps it was a truth that you knew but you had ignored until the bad signs because you know there can be bad things that happen if you ignore truth long enough and you have that aha moment in your life. There's a moment of of confrontation or maybe of tragedy or something that, that brought a truth that maybe you knew was true but you had kind of pushed it to the back of your mind or you didn't want to believe it. In religious circles, I know it is hard to believe things sometimes that my mom or dad didn't believe. It may be true and you may be thinking that, you know what, you know, I, I, I kind of think this way, but it's not what my mom taught. It's not what my dad taught. It's not what the preacher before the preacher now taught. So I'm really not sure. I'm just going to push it to the back burner. All of those things may be true. And then something comes up in your life. Something comes up in the lives of your children or a friend and a truth that was kind of sitting on the peripheral. It comes front and center in your life. And if you embrace it, it has the power to change your life. I think it was several years ago I told my most spiritual aha moment in life came when I was 16 years old. I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip to London, England. We were there for almost three weeks. We were in a little town called Wimley. At that time, it wasn't dangerous to walk around and knock on people's doors or just talk to people and ask them to come to church. And that's what we did. They had special meetings at church and they had things for kids. And so we just walked around the city of Wembley, uh, England, talking with people, asking them to come to a big meeting we were having and introducing to church members. If you didn't know about God, if you didn't know about Christ, we would love to have you as a part of that. Well, I got paired with a lady named Miss May. Miss May had never been married. She was from Canada and she was at that time between 75 and 80 years. old. I I don't remember. And we had the distinction of being both the youngest and the oldest on this mission trip. And somehow we got paired up together. So we're walking around the streets talking to people. And I think some people talked to us just because we looked like the odd couple who were there. Nobody would have paired us together. And I had, I guess, as much of a Southern accent as I had now. And people would say, well, I'm not really interested in what you have to say, but I'm interested in hearing you say it. So just keep talking. And like one guy, even a story, he gave me something. He said, just read this to me. And I was reading it. They were fascinated by it. But we met a lady. Her name was Lynn. Uh, Lynn didn't really say anything to us at first. She just smiled and, and kind of did like this to us. And as we got to know Lynn, through the eyes of one of her daughters who were here, who was there with her, who could speak a little bit of English because she had been in an English speaking school now for a year. We found out that Lynn was a Vietnamese refugee. This was 1976 in London, England. If you remember, those of you who know a little bit about history in April the 30th of 1975 is when the last helicopter took off of what was then Saigon in Vietnam. It's now changed to Ho Chi Minh City. But Saigon, I think we got a picture of one of the last helicopters taking off. And Lynn was in the next to the last helicopter to take off from there. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why this is, gets, I just get emotional looking at that because I look at so many people who knew If you go back and read through history, who knew if they didn't get on those helicopters, they were going to be killed. They were enemies of the North Vietnamese, and that helicopter was life or death. And you can go online if you want to, and you can Google when the last one took off, how there were people still lined up on that platform to get to it, and how they were just holding and seeing them drop, because they were so desperate to just be in a place that was better than what they had. They even did some things, the the next picture... uh, Uh, shows just the number of people. They're not breaking in to anything to do harm. That's a crowd of people that morning when they knew that the American troops were pulling out. That's a crowd of people who were trying to get in to the embassy, just hoping that there would be some way that they could get out of the country to safety. Then I've got one last picture. It's a picture, I I might have disabled it, Alana. It's a picture of a helicopter. You know what they're doing with a helicopter? They're pushing it off of an aircraft carrier so that they can hopefully get a few more people. They pushed over a hundred, I'm told, 
$250,000 aircrafts at the time to try to shove enough Vietnamese people on there because they knew to stay in Vietnam was their certain death. And at 16 years old, I meet this little lady named Lynn and I meet her daughter and she's got several other of her sons and daughters who didn't escape. Some of them who were on the ladder behind her, some of whom have to be in front of her. In fact, the little girl that was there interpreting for us that day happened to get on a helicopter, a few helicopters before then. In the mob, they were just all separated, all trying to get out. And she looked at us through an interpreter. When we talked about Jesus, she looked back at us and her words were this, Jesus who? Jesus who? Nobody ever said that to me before. I mean, I grew up knowing about Jesus. And I think I spent the early part of the years of my life knowing exactly what Jesus would do, or so I thought. I mean, I knew how he would act in church. I knew how he would take communion, how often he would take communion. I knew what the men could do. I knew what the women couldn't do. I mean, I knew all about doing church. But all of a sudden, I, come, I came face to face with the truth that nothing I knew about God from my past and all of the structure and all of the getting it right and the, and the formula and how we do stuff, I knew none of that was of any value to this little lady sitting in front of me who had never even heard of Jesus. And I had an aha moment that came on in my life. That as much as I valued my past and as much as I valued my upbringing and as much as, as, as I wanted to take hold of those stories, but I realized something. They had to be stories that taught me more than how to do Sunday morning. They had to be stories that pointed to something beyond just a gathering that I was a part of. They had to be stories that made a difference when I went out in the world and I watched and I think I had some of the best training in the world with Miss May. Because Miss May sat down and she just started talking through this little 12 or 13 year old girl who was there with us about a God she had a relationship with that was built upon truth and was built upon freedom and was built upon so many things that, that I had not experienced at that time. Most of my experience in religion up to that time was getting it right. <laughs> was, did, did anybody else have that same experience? That, that my biggest concern was don't mess up church. <laughs> I mean, make sure you get this part of, of everything right. And all of a sudden, everything else around me vanished in the moment when I realized that what she needed was somebody in front of her. And I watched Miss May through a teen interpreter talk to her about Jesus and how Jesus would come get her in her brokenness. And it was an aha moment that led to a search in my life that, that I, I just think even being here is a part of. Even going to college and majoring in accounting and all of that, never giving up on that. I want to tell this story because it meant something to me. And as I've gotten older, I've realized there are truths that we want to know like that because that kind of truth took me and it shaped me into the person that I am today. And I think it made me much more merciful to people. And it made me have a lot of grace with people that maybe I didn't have in my past. And it made me look introspectively and really realize that, Tom, as much as you may think you have it together, you don't have it together. And as much as I love now the, the verses that even Trent and I talked about yesterday in my office that said the Word of God falls fresh on us. I wasn't enabling the Word of God to fall fresh because I already had my mind made up. And it's funny, into a world like that is the world that Jesus came into. He came into a world of people who already had their minds made up as to what was right and what was wrong. And, and they didn't want to know whether this is true or not. And face it, aren't there some truths that you really would just rather not know? <laughs> like if you're a parent and the teacher calls and there's a problem, like, like I was better 10 minutes ago before this came in, into my being. If you're single and you're dating someone, man, you are like on fire and you're, you're loving it. And then somebody comes along and says, well, you need to know a little bit something. When I was dating him, when I was dating her, and you're like, no, 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 I don't want to hear that. Or maybe you're married and you've been ignoring the truth that's been coming in. You know there's some things that are not right, but you ignore it and you ignore it and you ignore it and, and you find out at the end it's never good to ignore what's right in front of you because all of a sudden maybe the marriage falls apart or things happen. Or you own a business 
And in the business, people come to you and, and, and maybe it's even been like a kind of church here that just kind of grew and grew and people call you and you think, oh, please let it be good. Please let it be good. If it's bad, I don't even want to hear it right now. I don't want to deal with that. And, but you know, really, you have to deal with those things because to ignore those things that are true in any area of your life doesn't do anyone any good. And although it's rational to kind of want to, it's never productive to do that. It's never productive to ignore what we know to be true or think to be true about our Heavenly Father. Just as it's never productive to ignore what we know to be true about our kids or our marriage or our finances or our business. And turning a blind eye to truth often leads and will probably most of the time lead to things that are not good. We all have things that we believe about God that we would like to be true. But when we look at them, we really find, well, we've really made God in our own image, haven't we? Do you find yourself ever believing things about God that really aren't true? I tried to think of and I tried to look up some of the dangerous things that we believe. I believe one of the most dangerous, I hate to use the word lie because it, it sounds so strong, but maybe one of the dangerous lies about God that's out there is this in our culture right now, that in order to be a good Christ follower, I have to agree with you in order to love you. I think it's a lie from Satan that is out there right now. If you are a parent, you know that that's not true because I bet every one of you, like me, have children who have done things that you didn't agree with and yet you love them infinitely. Even in John chapter 8, in one of the, the, the biggest stories that people love to, to talk about that shows just unconditional grace and unconditional mercy. When this lady is brought into the very presence of Jesus and the law says stone her and the teachers of the law say stone her and everything else says she's brought in front of him and she's probably naked, most scholars would say. Maybe they gave her time to get a robe, maybe not. She's probably dirty where they've thrown her down in the dust and the only one to offer her grace and the only one to offer her forgiveness and the only one to offer her mercy was Jesus. Jesus. And yet in that moment, he looked at her and said, I think in the, the kindest voice he could, quit doing what you're doing. It's a lie. It's a dangerous lie in any avenue of your life to believe that you have to agree with someone, to love someone. Another thing that I think it's kind of dangerous to believe it's an untruth about God is this, is that my God won't let anything happen to me because I mean, taking care of me is his number one job. He's not going to let anything happen to me. He's not going to let anything happen to my family because his job is to protect us. And all you have to do is to open up the pages of scripture to read that some of the greatest atrocities happened to people who loved Jesus the most. That being a follower of God isn't, isn't a, a guarantee of a life that, that, that doesn't struggle. Dan and I were talking this week and Dan does a lot of our counseling here. And one of the things he said that in counseling, a lot of times he has to break down with people is this, is the lie that God is far from them because they're facing a, a problem in their life or they're facing the, the trouble in their life. When the truth of the matter is this, that God more often is closer than you think. I think another thing is that kind of counteracts that is the half brother of Jesus who in the book of James was, was looking to people out there and he said you need to know something he said this is what I want you to do I don't want you to think that God is far from you when troubles come your way but I want you to know something that in your troubles I would like you to find a way to rejoice to count it all joy, he says, when you face trials of many kinds, because you can know something that your trial, if you will let it, will bring you closer to your heavenly father than you were before. I think the third thing I've got down is, is dangerous to believe is that my God won't let anything happen to me financially. Because man, I give and, and I do all these things and I serve. When you look at scripture again, you find out that that's not necessarily the case. Another thing 
that's dangerous to believe about God is this, is that my God will assure me, I mean, if I just pray the right prayers and do the right thing, that my God will assure that my kids turn out right, that everything will be successful. I mean, I've got everything in a row and I've been praying for them since they were little. And so nothing else matters and that God is obligated to protect them. And all you, all you gotta do is have kids to realize that there are so many other influences and that God doesn't do with them what he doesn't do with me. He doesn't take away their choice. And here's one that uh, uh, some of you may like hate me for saying. I hope that, that you don't hate me for saying this because whatever you do, you, you, you got to do it in love. So even if I say something you don't like here, you got to love me anyway. So raise your right hand and say you love me. I've talked to some parents before that, that if you just listen to them for a minute, you would think that they have bought into the idea that God is laser focused in on their kid's next basketball game. <laughs> I mean, that his greatest concern, that he is up in there in heaven, he is going like, shh, I know we got problems with China, and I know Mexico is like on the border trying to get over, but my kid is about to throw a, you know, a three-pointer, so angels, be quiet till we get this out of the way. <laughs> and by the way, God, could you ignore all those people on the other team who are praying fervently that my child doesn't make this three-pointer right now? <laughs> And I wonder sometimes if all these things, and maybe we don't say it out loud, but don't we often live that way? Don't we often, although I would probably never verbalize that, how many times in your family have you put other things in front of maybe something that you should have done instead of that? I think one of the other things that we deceive ourselves into thinking is that my sins and the things that I let lurk around my life are, are not really much compared to other people's. I mean, it's why we keep doing them. I mean, my things, they're not a big deal. I mean, it's just a little thing and it's just on the edges and God, you got much bigger fish to fry than this. So I'm just gonna let my little thing sit and I'm gonna let it lie. And I don't realize that, man, that little thing over time is gonna become a big thing. And we kind of excuse ourselves sometimes because there's other things out there going on. And, and then maybe number seven, maybe the last one I'll do today is this. I think one of the biggest lies is, um, and, and this is, this is one is hard to say because you know, the best lies are the ones that have an element of truth in them. You, you know that, but this kind of what I'm going to say on its surface is a lie, but I don't want you to hear it as a straight out lie. I want you to hear a little bit of truth in this is that God's utmost importance is for me to be happy. That that's God's utmost concern out there. And that's a lie. Now, I think God wants me to be happy. And I think he shows me how to be happy. But if you come to Christ thinking that his number one job in my life is to make me happy, then the minute things happen in life that make me unhappy, then who do I give up on? I give up on God because he's not done his job. You see... That's what I want God to be about. And when I read messages that conflict with that, it often messes up my world and there's something in me. I bet is there's something in each of you that says, I don't want to believe all of those things. And there's a price. If you believe the wrong thing about certain situations or about God or your heavenly father, there's a consequence of doing that. Do you realize that? That for everything you believe about God or your heavenly father that isn't true, there is a corresponding consequence to that. As in this, if you believe or if you choose to bind to the lie that I have to agree with you to love you, if you take that out to its fullest extreme, it means you'll never discipline your children. And it also means that you'll never lead anyone out of darkness because you have suddenly come to believe that everybody's own truth is their truth. That what everybody wants to believe is just what they want to believe. And even going back to the days of Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived in Proverbs chapter 14, he said, there's a way that seems right. And there may be even a way, Tom, that you want to be right. And you may live your life trying to make every excuse in the world. But Solomon says, if you choose to ignore the values and the things that God put in order, he says, anything that you may want to be right, it only leads to a place of death. If you choose to believe, like I said before, that God's major concern is for us to be happy, then you walk away from life when God doesn't make you happy. If you believe like some people in scripture did that every time something bad happens that God is punishing you, you'll give up on God and you'll lose trust in your heavenly father. If you believe that your church routine 
that how you do church and what happens when, when there's a little gathering here together, that if I do things in a certain way and in a certain order, then God is obligated to bless me and to help me. You, the consequence of believing that is this, is you will never have a personal relationship with your heavenly father. And you'll always be looking at people who seem close to him and you'll stand back and you say, well, you know, they seem crazy. They seem off in the distance. I don't understand that. A personal relationship with God. What is that all about? I mean, I've never really had that. And the reason you never had that is because your whole life has been focused on what you can do and you getting it right instead of trusting in a God who already got it right. There's a consequence of believing things like that. If you believe that you have to have the answers to all your questions before you can trust God for something, you'll never trust him for anything. Because in this life, you never get all the I's dotted and you never get all the T's crossed. And I've had people before tell me, well, well, I'm waiting on this to happen or this hasn't happened in my life and I'm waiting on this to happen. I'm waiting on over here for something else to happen. And if everything has to happen in your life and line up before you think you can trust God, you'll never really trust him for anything. And into all those situations is where Jesus showed up. He showed up in, into people's lives who believed all of those things that I just said. He showed up into people's lives who believed that if you were sick, God was against you. And if God was against you, why should I help you? It's why they had so many people in his day who they needed a social security system because if God has cursed you and if God has made you sick, then it's not my obligation to do for you what God hasn't. And yet God comes in the flesh and when he comes, he said, I'm coming to show you what the father would do. And so he starts hanging around sick people. Why did he hang around sick people so much? Because he was combating this falsehood that was out there. This falsehood that said God has forgotten you and God has abandoned you. So he hangs around those people. And there was a, a feeling in their day that if you were rich and if you were successful, then God has blessed you and God was for you. But if you were poor, God was against you. And yet there are 2,000 verses, over 2,000 verses in Scripture that talk about how we are to treat poor people and how we are to treat people who don't have what we have. And let me tell you, it is one of the reasons that I have fallen in love with you. It is one of the reasons when I go out of town, even though I may need a rest, I miss being here because I don't know of many places who have the number we do that in one day can get a waiting list for 48 orphans and build six wells and have people come into your office and talk about how to build a school building. And I don't know of another congregation that's out there that says, if you need money for camp, we're going to give you money for camp. If we don't have money for this today, we're going to trust God for us, but we're going to get your kids to camp. Because God was about poor people. And sometimes it's not that you're poor people. Sometimes it's just unfortunate incidents that's happened to you. And all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation and God was all over those people. I love what Paul said. And I've been, you know, it's one of the verses that have been on my mind this week. It comes from the book of Philippians where he says, but Christ has shown me that, when I, that what I once thought was valuable is worthless. Nothing is as wonderful as knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And I have given up everything else and counted all as garbage. All I want is Jesus. And sometimes I tell you, I go back to my house and I, and I look at two cars in the driveway and, and I look at a garage out there and I look at a house attached to it and, and I see things like I saw last week and I realize some of them don't even have a house and my car has a house it lives in. I mean, my car doesn't even have to wonder where it's going to go at night because it has a nice little garage that I can pull in to. And I wonder if I could be like Paul where I could get to the point where I look at all this stuff that God has blessed me in and go in my closet and look at just the number of things that I have. I wonder if I could get to the point in my life where I just said, you know what, God, I, what I want to do is one day be able to look at this stuff and, said, and just say to it, it is, it is worthless compared to the all-surpassing knowledge of knowing you and that I would give it all up in a second if it was a choice between the stuff and the you. And I confess, just, just this week I've been struggling with that. Would I do that? Would I do that? Do I really believe that, that all that stuff is just stuff? 
And Paul says, I gave it up. All I want to do is Christ. Well, it's 10.04 and we got to go. And like, I'm just right in the middle. So let me just tell you, we're just going to skip all the way to the end. They, like us, believe so many things that weren't true about God. And Jesus comes on the scene and he said, here's what I've come to do. I've come to show you what your heavenly father is like. I've come to show you how your heavenly father would live. So he looks and in John chapter eight, put this verse on the screen for me, Atlanta, just skip to the end to John chapter eight. I'll turn to it here. He says to the Jews who had believed in him, I, I highlighted that word had because they are a lot like us. They believed in him. They wanted him to be true. But now all of a sudden he's saying things that the religious leaders are like, mm, I don't know about taking people away from them. He said to them, if you hold to my teaching, hold to my teaching. Some of your versions will say abide. Some of your versions will say remain. Some of your versions will say stand fast in my teaching. He says, you are really, I love the, the version that says, then you will show yourself to be my disciples. What he's really saying is don't give up on me. He says, then, the very next word, the very next verse starts with then. Then, then, then when, then after I have held, after I have remained, after I have abided, after I have listened to what Jesus had to say, and even though it's uncomfortable, and even though it's different, and even though it may not be what I'd always heard and what I've always taught, if I will stand there in the light of what God is saying, he says, then something will happen that is spectacular. He says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, what I've always believed about God won't set me free. What my mom had taught me about God won't necessarily set me free. Or what my daddy taught or what my preacher before me taught or even what I taught doesn't have the ability to set you free. What has the ability to set you free, Jesus said, is the truth. And he compares it. If you go into the rest of that, he says, the truth is like being in a dark room. Have you ever been in a movie theater and it's dark and you, you don't go through the lobby where it gradually gets lighter, but you decide to scoot out a back door and all of a sudden it's bright and you can't see anything. <laughs> and all of you, you've got two choices at that point, don't you? You can run back into the darkness where you're like, oh, like this is better. Or you can stay out there for a few minutes and all of a sudden things begin to come clear. And Jesus looks and he tells these people, I know what they've told you. And I know what you believed all your life, but I got a message for you. If you will remain, if you will abide, if you will stay in the truth of what I'm saying, there will become a point where your eyes adjust and you will see things about your heavenly father that you have never seen before. And then he makes it this promise. And that truth that you see has the power to set you free. And that's where we're going to go over the next few weeks. Just stories in scripture of men and women who chose to stay in the light of God's word, no matter how uncomfortable it was with the promise that if I stay, if I remain, don't run, don't quit. You will know your heavenly father like you have never known him before. I hope it will be a wonderful series for you. And next week, we're just going to dive in to the glory of God as seen through two men who were alive and two men who were dead. I hope it will be good for you. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for loving us, for being a good God to us. And uh, uh, Father, I pray that we will do exactly these, that we will choose to, to not believe what the world says about you, but Father, that we will take you as you are and that we will un come to understand you more over the stories and the lives of people than maybe we ever have before. And your promise to us will hold true, that we will know the truth and the truth has the power to set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.